let me welcome all of you uh, very warmly to this, in fact, third annual conference of uh, the Risk Institute. Uh, I was just confirmed that the opening conference was not the first annual conference, but that we had four conferences, but three annual conferences. And that corresponds also to the structure of our uh, endeavor in three clusters. And the three clusters had respectively annual conferences. And from there, you may understand that we are a little bit at the end of a first term of funding, of uh, intellectual discussion. Um, oh, sorry, this Falstaffian um, board is a little bit a moving target. Um, and, uh, and, and that we will, will move forward to a second phase. Uh, and in so far, this conference, uh, I guess, will have also a kind of double character to summarize some of the achievements of the first uh, period, but also opening avenues to what will be important in the second um, uh, phase. Um, we were often asked, and uh, I guess Olaf Krosamba can confirm uh, that he was asked again during the evaluation, what are the major achievements of FGZ uh, over the past years? And uh, the answer is, of course, they were manifold. Uh, because we had so many uh, places, disciplines, uh, researchers at work, that it is clear uh, that we could list in a very long uh, way uh, what we have achieved. But we organized ourselves uh, into these mentioned three clusters uh, which aimed at complementary results. From the point of view of cluster three only, on whose research this conference is primarily based without neglecting the references to the other two clusters, we are faced with a certain paradox. The foundation of the FGZ set was inspired by the emerging prominence of the concept of gesellschaftlicher Zusammenhalt. And since I have to speak in English, I use now social cohesion, being well aware that social cohesion has a completely different intellectual trajectory than this famous gesellschaftlicher Zusammenhalt. Uh, it should not go unmentioned that the many different initiators had very, very different ideas about what kind of cohesion should be defended or restored. Because, of course, it makes a difference whether we are talking about new projects of solidarity across national borders or about catching the danger that an alternative right-wing populist movement and later party will be permanently establish itself uh, to the right of the CDU. Sticking together against the right or sticking together with the right to smoother the alternative in its embrace. In the years since 2019, we have discovered at the same time that social cohesion in various translations spread internationally, like a wildfire. And if you look back, we also see historically different configurations of what would be called societal cohesion today. Methodologically, then, it depends on whether we consider social cohesion to be an objectively given fact that can be found everywhere, that can be measured accordingly to a greater or lesser degree, and that is called by different names. But that always remains recognizable behind these names as something that can be defined quite well. So social cohesion as something that exists. Or else we begin to wonder why, once the term social cohesion is used for the facts and in other places and at other times, another name is chosen. Uh, then it may be empire, nation, society, community, etc., etc. Does it matter that there are different names? This conference starts from the conviction that it does indeed matter and that we need to ask ourselves why it is precisely around 2015-16 that this new terminology became so prominent. Yeah? And you see the conflict between these two positions. When you are convinced that social cohesion is something that exists already for centuries, then you have not to wonder why this term comes up at a certain moment. In the other perspective, you have dramatically to wonder why all of a sudden people call a thing that existed obviously beforehand uh, in a new way. Um, the volumin voluminous uh, seven-volume work Geschichtliche Grundbegriffe, 
also started from the idea that it is not incidental in which terms we express our observations of reality and why some terms prevail and others just do not. Uh, and this work is very familiar to historians. I guess other disciplines have other references uh, to similar uh, ideas that uh, it matters how we call things. From here, a tremendously productive strand of empirically investigated conceptual history has developed, now gladly also with digital humanities and the evaluation of mass sources instead of high altitude citations only. Thus, in, in addition to the question of interest elsewhere in the FGZ, whether there is here or enough of the right cohesion or whether it is fundamentally endangered. The question of why this terminology has become prominent in various corners of the world in a very short time comes to the fore. The choice of this terminology is an indicator of something, and we should ask ourselves what that something is exactly. This, however, encounters more difficulties than one might suspect at the outset. And I mention only two basic ones. One, Every conceptual history has to be considered in its context. So one needs a lot of area expertise to accurately interpret a perhaps even apparent coincidence of similar terms. It goes without saying that you have to know the country, the people, the language, the culture, and many other things, but the world is a big place. And there are many cases, and it would completely overcharge the resources of FGZ to investigate all these different places. So we have to find criteria for selection of cases. So it is necessary to proceed selectively, and thus one carries traces of one's own presuppositions into the research setting. That is a fundamental methodological problem. Why is Trump for us more interesting than the leaders in Indonesia? Um, there are good arguments, but also less convincing ones. And the second uh, problem is that transnational conceptual history is methodologically almost dramatically difficult. Because unfortunately, the groups of speakers do not remain uninfluenced by each other, but exchange, um, in, in, uh, but they exchange developmental steps of their respective conceptualizations with each other in the most complicated uh, way, by traveling, by reading uh, the texts of others, etc. I only mention here uh, the fact that Black Lives Matter has made a journey around the world uh, relatively independent from what happened in the US around uh, this uh, term. And we see it in very, very different variants in Germany, France, or South Korea. The times when one could write a history of basic concepts um, only for the German Reich, as it was the case in the Geschichtliche Grundbegriffe, are over. But good global cross-sections are still rare today. There is a huge research task lurking here that would actually be worthy of an FGZ. And the insights that could be gained into the question of who achieves cultural hegemony in the guise of the new terminology, for example, cohesion, are of the highest relevance for our society which is striving to position itself right now strategically in an increasingly complex environment. I refer only to this famous paper about the strategic goals of the federal government uh, in international contexts, uh, where all of a sudden we map the world uh, in friends and competitors and enemies, uh, which then means that we have to compete with their different understandings of cohesion. So, that is, in, in brief, uh, the idea behind uh, this strangely looking uh, title, what is a, a globally uh, attractive concept. And um, I was simply intended to make that clear from the outset that it is not about social cohesion as a fact in, let's say, South Africa or Greenland but it is about the way how social cohesion is conceptualized uh, in these different places. So that was um, the point that was supposed to last 15 minutes, uh, and I'm happy to have done that uh, shorter. Uh, and uh, we come to our first uh, keynote.
And I'm extremely happy that Stefanie Schüler-Springorum accepted the invitation for that keynote. Uh, we just talked about how important keynotes are in the biography. But at a certain point, uh, it is no longer really important to have a keynote, but to have the chance to express oneself. I guess that is the most important issue here. She is a professor uh, at uh, Technical University Berlin and heads there the Center for Research on Antisemitism since 2011. Since 2012, she is also the co-director of the Center for Jewish Studies, Berlin Brandenburg. Uh, her research fields are German Jewish history, the history of National Socialism and Holocaust, and Spanish history. A gender historical perspective determines all of her work. The most important uh, publications, and I'm always unsure how one can formulate that sentence, the most important, because that can only the author decide. Uh, uh, but to mention the, the monograph Perspektiven Deutscher Jüdischer, Deutsch -Jüdischer Geschichte, Geschlecht und Differenz, the volume Four Years After, Ethno-Nationalism, Antisemitism and Racism in Trump's America, and a volume on football and discrimination, antisemitism and uh, beyond, uh, recently published in London 20. Today she will speak about uh, historical perspective, so that dimension where we diachronically compare the different understandings of what is addressed as social cohesion or uh, respective alternatives uh, by focusing uh, on uh, religious and language diversity in the German Empire and its social implication. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, that's the wrong address, but it's, um, it's an older um, uh, PowerPoint because what I'm doing now, uh, I take, first of all, thank for the invitation, the honor to speak here, here and also the chance to say whatever I want. <laughs> and uh, what I want to do now is to go really back in my biography and go back to the region that I worked on <clears throat> for my PhD, which was East Prussia. So you'll get a full load of 19th century East Prussia now. And I decided I will not apologize for this, but uh, on the contrary, I think as a historian, and not surprisingly as a historian, I'm quite convinced that even a pretty down-to-earth historical perspective can be useful for our rather contemporary deliberations here at the Risk Institute. And this is what I want to present here. As we all know, and as we just heard, the term social cohesion has recently experienced this tremendous career as a political concept, and at the same time has been criticized academically for being the expression of certain social interests or relying or at least fostering frameworks of national unity or of national perspectives. Its obvious tendency to ideas of homogeneity and thus to practices of exclusion forms the core of many of our projects here and discussions parting from the assumption that the term social cohesion implicitly and sometimes explicitly carries a certain nostalgia, a longing for a time where things seem to have been better or at least easier and that this was somehow naturally so due to a greater degree of homo social homogeneity in the past. So for the next 20 minutes, I would encourage us to take one step back and to examine this I would call it subcutaneous, and maybe at the same time global, this is to be discussed, prerequisite for the mere idea of social cohesion, namely that of a historically given homogeneity. More often than not, this is framed in terms of race, culture, language, and religion, much less so, by the way, in terms of uh, class or gender, which I think would be another conference in it for itself that we could think about. For now, I would, uh, as I said, simply like to take a brief look at the state of affairs some 100 to 150 years ago in this country in order to show once more, which is not surprising, that history is much more messy 
and uh, then later discourse would like to have it. And then in the second step, ask what that might mean for our present discussion on social cohesion, namely and namely on the relationship of democracy and cohesion. So if you pause to imagine the German Empire between 1871 and 1918, I hope so, at least what comes to your mind is exactly this. No, oh, now it's gone. <laughs> black, yeah, a black slide, that's uh, even better. Okay, thank you. So there's someone helping there. Okay, or maybe it's magic. But this is the German Empire, and this is what I want you to think. I want you to see like a monolithic, uniform, homogeneous block lying broad and big across Europe's middle. And in my talk today, I would like to disturb that image a bit, not because I think history of the Kaiserreich has to be rewritten, but rather to show you that it wasn't all that homogeneous, surprise, surprise, and all that monolithic. It wasn't so, not religiously, not ethnically, although I'd like to use the letter concept in square notes, as I'll explain in the course of my paper. And this diversity becomes clear in the following two slides. Now let's see. Yeah, this is the religious diversity of 1890, distribution of various Christian denominations. So you see it's becoming already quite fuzzy. And then we look at the distribution of languages in the Third Reich, which is also not what one would think when one thinks about the German Reich. You look especially at the green body, which is the Polish-speaking population. So what I would like to draw your attention, or rather imagination to, is the magnitude of effort that had to be put into the forming of a more or less cohesive German nation state from this scattered mass, especially the first one, and especially at the margins. And in doing so, I intend to limit myself to one single aspect of this huge effort in homogenization and nationalization, and to show how three criteria in their respective entanglements would constantly become racialized um, and thus been seen as opposed to this effort aiming at cohesion. And these markers, so to speak, are religion, language, and of course, last but not least, social class. Or to put it differently, I would like to show how the respective religion, mother tongue, and social status of a certain group <laughs> shaped the state policy towards that group, and how this in turn determined its collective and individual opportunities for participation, and in the end also, to a certain extent, their self-perception. As you know, recently there have been some debates here in Germany regarding the character of the German Empire on whether its authoritarian or its democratic features ultimately have been more formative. Looking at this debate from the perspective of social cohesion, the outcome is as ambivalent as the empire itself, which Hans-Ulrich Wähler once called, I'm quoting, a mixture of federative confederation and Prussian hegemony with autonomous districts for the bureaucracy, military and foreign policy on the one hand, and parliament with the most democratic voting rights in Europe at that time on the other. So this quite ambivalent mixture was naturally also the case when it came to those citizens who sensed themselves a minority in the new political state or were viewed as such by others. Laws that affected them were discussed and passed in the parliament, but were often preceded by interventions that were not democratically legitimated, even from above, from the influential Prussian administration, which of course was likewise not elected. That's the one, that's like the top-down perspective, but at the same time, even those citizens too were able to articulate their interest in associations, leagues, and parties, giving those special interests a political shape. Nevertheless, inherent tensions in the empire led to a situation where the Chancellor Bismarck, or the governments that came after him, tended repeatedly to press forward with the political integration of this very heterogeneous state by domestic, so-called domestic campaigns, using all um, possible propagandistic means and others engaged in combating the so-called internal enemies of the Reich, the inneren Reichsfeinde. And this was a struggle that affected all minorities, albeit with different inten differing intensity and sharpest, most probably in the long run, targeting the social democracy, but that's a topic I will leave out here. So now I have to go back again to this. Exactly. I'll begin my assessment by looking at the largest religious minority group in the country, the Catholics. 
As you all know, immediately after the successful establishment of the new state, Bismarck began a bitter struggle, the so-called Kulturkampf, against the Roman Catholic population. Catholics were labeled enemies of the Reich, with supranational connections and alliances to the Vatican, the so-called ultramontane controversy. Backed by the liberal parties and intellectuals who wanted to turn this new state, I mean, it was a very recent state, it's only two years after it's coming into being, they wanted to turn this new state into a modern bulwark against trad traditionalist backwardness and religious superstition, as they called us. So numerous repressive laws and measures restricting Catholic freedom of worship were passed. As for example, the pulpit laws foresaw um, a penalty of two years of prison for criticism of the state during a sermon. The Jesuit order was banned and the so-called May laws of 1873 established state supervision over di diverse areas previously controlled by the church, such as schooling, marriage, education, training of theologians, etc. This may in our ears still sound somehow reasonable, maybe. Uh, all compassing supervision of religious services and associations led to numerous legal proceedings against violations or alleged violations of these laws, which in turn were punished by banishing priests from localities, even from Germany by expatriation, by seizures of property, and by prison sentences. One year later, half of all the bishops in Prussia were in prison which is quite, I think, a number. And in some places, all this led to civil war-like divisions within the localities. When all this threatened to tear apart the country that had only recently been united, most repressive laws, except the Jesuit and ban, were taken back five years later, I mean, in 1978, 1878, sorry. And in the end, the Catholic party, the so-called Centrum, emerged substantially strengthened from this conflict because it had been able to mobilize almost 100% of his, its camp. On the political level, the party then integrated into the Bismarckian structure of power and was successfully instrumentalized in the struggle against the social democrats and later, one, later on against the liberals. However, on a social and cultural level, the Kulturkampf left deep wounds. From then on, the Catholics felt they were a hostile minority under attack in the new state, and they withdrew more and more into their own milieu. The experience of persecution, prison, discrimination, which was bound up for many with a lower educational and social status, the sense of being second-class citizens was passed on amongst Catholics for generations, ultimately very slowly to dissolve only in the Federal Republic after World War II to dissolve in the Federal Republic only after World War II. And that this is not an exaggeration can be illuminated, if I, may, if I may do so, by a personal anecdote from the history of my own family. When my parents married in 1961, um, there was a sp small scandal at their wedding. The Catholic side, let it be made known to the to the audience, to the marriage, to the wedding party, that the great-grandfather of my Protestant father had back then thrown the great-grandfather of my Catholic mother into prison. Um, so the name Springorum, as the incarnation of Protestant evil, had been preserved for more than a century, almost a century, in my mother's family memoir, which I think is the important point of the story. But there was still the knowledge there that Springorum is something really bad. In the end, they were allowed to marry, but still. And similar, similar tales are likely part of the memory of those families for which the Kulturkampf did not come to an end in 1878, but was rather combined with a variant of exclusion that was in the long run even more poisonous, namely Slavophobia, in this case, aversion against the Polish-speaking segment of the Prussian population, which in 1914 amounted to 10% of its population. Now we go up there. Um, but what you can see there, I mean, or, may, or more or less imagine from behind, they were between, depends how you, how you want to split up the Polish speaking groups, but they are between, let's say, two or four groups. You have, like in, in Southeast Prussia, Südost Preußen, you have the Sorbs, which we still have, then you have the Lithuanians and the Poles in Western Prussia, Posen and Silesia.
Um, for all of them, the new nation state brought a sharp cut with the traditional Prussian policies. Because, and I, this is, I think, important to remember, and it's often forgotten, under Prussian rule in the monarchy until 1871, the principles of a multi-ethnic large empire had retained their validity for all linguistic and religious groups. The settlement and development policy in Prussia had initially initially facilitated since the time of Frederick the Great by recruiting Huguenots, Dutch, Salzburgers, Scots, and Bohemians. Every individual had the religious right to become blessed in his or her own way. Jeder soll nach seiner Fasson selig werden. This is still what we remember um, from this part. And in addition, they had the right of freedom of religious practice in their own mother tongue. Since only in that way, as numerous Prussian administrative regulations stated, would it be possible to reach the heart of the people. So instruction, especially in religion, but all other instruction as well, had to be in the mother tongue. In particular, King Frederick William IV had repeatedly emphasized this, as evident from a report in 1841, and I'm quoting now. The king loves and honors the mother tongue, but at the same time also recognizes every foreign language and nationality, and is particularly resolved to carefully care likewise for the people speaking non-German languages that are subject to his rule, so that in future no nationality shall be extinguished like that of the people whose name the entire state bears. This refers to the Putzen. Who, gave the, who were extinguished by uh, the process of Christianization and who gave the name to the Prussian state. So in the re revolutionary debates that raged around 1848, foreign language was not at all viewed as something clashing with citizenship. As a quote from the National Assembly makes very clear, I'm quoting, all who reside in Germany are Germans, even if not Germans by dint of birth or language. End of quote. We have not reached this stage yet, as we all know. <clears throat> However, a correspond correspondingly anchored protection of nationalities as envisioned by the 1849 constitution was not incorporated into the Reich constitution of 1871. Rather to the contrary, in the context of the nationalistic tendencies, new mechanisms of inclusion and exclusion were set in motion. And not accidentally, these mechanisms began precisely at that juncture when the first push for homogenization in the religious sphere, the Kulturkampf, had more or less ended in tattered failure. Having been branded as religious enemies in the 1870s, the Catholic Poles now found themselves um, being turned into nation, nation, national enemies and objects of a massive policy of Germanization starting in, 1880, in the 1880s. It was accompanied by very pronounced, aggressive, anti-Slavic and anti-Polish undertones as stated by Bismarck himself, and I'm quoting. Hit the Poles so that they lose the very hope for their lives. I have great sympathy for their situation, but if we want to go on to, if we want to go on to exist and prevail, we have no choice but to exterminate them, end of quote. Despite this clear wording, Bismarck made an equally clear distinction between those who were to be regarded as Poles and those who were not, with different consequences for their respective rights to land and language. Because directly affected was only the Catholic Polish population in West Prussia, Silesia, and Posen. The anti-Polish policy began in 1885-86 with the extremely brutal expulsion of some 50,000 Poles of unresolved citizenship. If the measures here had been primarily affected poor, impoverished Poles, steps were subse subsequently, and Jews, by the way, Polish Jews, steps were subsequently taken against the material possessions of the, of the richer Poles, the Polish rural nobility, the church, and the urban middle classes in the East. It was a fight for land. Polish ownership of land was transferred into German ownership, and purchase of land by citizens speaking Polish was to be prevented. Due to massive Polish resistance, this policy of, you know, of, of Germanization of the soil had proven just as much a failure as had the policy of settlement of German-speaking settlers, so that the state after 1900 resorted to ever more radical methods, leading finally in 1908 to simply expropriation by law. So they resulted in, in simple you know, taking away the land by law. Yet with this step, 
it became evident what also had been the case in connection with earlier measures. Not only did this policy go against what the Poles said, the words of our former king, of the Prussian kings, um, but it also violated the principle of equality laid down in the Constitution. And it, of course, it also violated numerous liberal principles like the freedom of movement and the freedom of property. The Germanization policy thus manifested the unequal treatment of a specific nationality and the fact that politically it was very evident to the liberal and social democratic camps and was subjected to public critique, but it wasn't stopped. But maybe even more lasting was the impact of the language policy on the Polish-speaking population of the empire because it penetrated deeply into the private family life. <clears throat> Manifested in several administrative measures, this poli policy targeted cultural identity. German was not only to be established as the official language of administration, courts and associations, but was also to be furthered as first language in the schools. By contrast, Polish as a mother tongue was to be taught to children only in religion class, and when this was also revoked in 1908, 50,000 Polish children entered into a school strike. The official side reacted to the strike by the customary means, sanctions, penalties, prison, imprisonment of the parents. But events such as a school strike you know, underscore the high degree to which the Polish-speaking Catholic citizens, which until 1871 peacefully integrated into existing state structures, had been mobilized to a level of self-assertion now national in conception and ultimately successful. All this came as a consequence not of any specific ethnic or religious feeling or identity, as we always use these words that we keep using, but developed due to a radical state policy that repeatedly viola had violated the Constitution. How dramatic this break was, not only with the constitution, but also with the multi-ethnic tradition of the Prussian kingdom, becomes clear if you look at the completely different way in which the state dealt with Polish native speakers who were Protestant, as they had long been the majority in southeastern Prussia. This is the, the yellow, green, yellow part in southeastern Prussia. And also the case, um, the same mechanism comes into play for the Protestant Prussian Lithuanians. Both groups, Lithuanian and Polish Protestants, or Lithuanian and Polish-speaking Protestant, constituted a propertyless rural population living in great poverty as remnants of a pre-national era which could not be clearly categorized in ethnic terms. However, as Protestants who had been Prussianized in social terms and who were faithful to the king, their mother tongues were treated quite differently from those of the Catholic Poles. The attitude of the Protestant church was the decisive factor here. In the 19th century, through its clergy, schools, and associations, it had been the most important agent of education in the East Prussian countryside. And up until 1871, the Polish language, as a marker of difference, had never been a problem there, since it was religion that formed the central social reference, reference frame rather than an ethnic belonging that was merely linguistically defined. On the contrary, Polish enjoyed in the Protestant circles in the East special admir admiration and respect um, as a lingua sacra. Polish was the language of liturgy, of prayer, of children's education. Polish was, as, as one observer put it, the language of the heart. This basic positive attitude, also shared by East Prussian administrators, continued to exist for a time, even when, with the implementation of the state policy of Germanization, Polish was slated to be eliminated from the schools also in southeastern Prussia. Thus, for example, in 1873, the district president of Gumbinnen, on the very eastern part there, um, the district which had both Polish-speaking and Lithuanian-speaking population, championed the idea that school instruction should take place again in the respective mother tongue of the pupils, and I'm quoting, considering religious and moral education which can only occur successfully in a manner enriching the pupils' lives by the means of the mother tongue as a medium. This was like the position of the East uh, 
Prussian administration at that time. An additional element in the resistance by this ad administration and also by the church was the fact that for a long time it had been impossible to find suitable teachers of German who would, would be willing to relocate to this remote and very poor region of the German Reich. If the Polish language and the Lithuanian as well had remained comparatively better protected for a longer period in the extreme eastern areas than in the Catholic regions due to the dominance of the Protestant church there, the nationalist turn in the Protestant church in the late empire in the end also extended its influence out to these remote regions as well. Yet that extension came about with a linguistic and cultural changing of names. Polish then became Mazurian at the turn of the century, though never really consistently before 1914, and Southeast Prussia became Mazuria, and Prussian Lithuania was rechristened Mimeland, and I think we all know these names still. Their special traditions were considered worthy of preservation just as long as they retained their clear distance from Polish nationalism. Yet that was almost always the case because of the deep gulf of religious division that separated the extremely religious um, Protestant groups in the, po in the East from the Polish-speaking Roman Catholics within and beyond the borders. The Polish-speaking East Prussians had no intercessors outside the country, and with the German Empire, their advocates became ever fewer as nationalist Protestantism increased its hold. And the general devaluation of Polish led to the consequences. The German-speaking middle class, the burgerdom in the East Prussian towns and cities, made no secret of its sense of cultural superiority or, as clergymen or teachers, displayed an interest now that was paternalistic or ethnographic. But still, and we are around 1900, so the reports by visiting school commissions prove just how slowly in the following decades was the actual pace at which the German language was gaining a stronger foothold in the East. The consequence then for the new generation of Southeast Prussian children was that in the end, around 1900, they knew neither German nor could they read or write their mother tongue Polish. Many parents perceived this as an additional stigma and this may, weigh, may have given some impetus to a now voluntary turn into, towards German. In addition, another factor here was that the Polish speaking East Prussians as a result of the Dreiklassenwahlrecht, the three-class franchise system, were unable to build up their own distinctive political representation. So here's class at play as well. They were and remained impoverished rural residents, faithful to the king, people who were of interest to the politicians, representing them only as servants, agricultural laborers or soldiers. This, and I'm quoting Andreas Kossert here, ethnically motivated colonialism in one's own country combined with the staggered, staggering poverty and massive immigration to the west of the Reich, to the rural area, led to a process where this specific cultural form in the Prussian East slowly withered away. Its traces preserved today only in certain family names and fortunately in German football culture, as we have Schalke 04 representing the Masurians and Borussia Dortmund was a foundation of the Polish Catholics, Catholic ports of the East. So, in closing, I wish to let me look at the yeah, okay. In closing, I wish to contrast this by looking at that group that is most commonly associated with the concept of a discriminated minority, and which in our sampling down to 1914, in fact, fares the best, namely the German Jews. For the Jews, and I know that you all know this, but I will be very, very fast. The German Kaiserreich resulted in the long desired civil equality, the consummation of the emancipation begun a century before. Central for them was the regulation that the rights and duties of the citizen had to be independent from religious affiliation. And we have already seen in the example of the Prussian Poles that how the, that how the principles of the constitution were dealt with in practice was quite ambiguous and that in dealing with a group defined as different by language or religion, or not just there, constitutional rights were often violated, legal regulations were eroded through discrimi discrimination by administration, by Ermessungsspielraum, as we call it today, and of course with the blessing of the state. In regard to the, Jewish, uh, to the male Jewish population, that principle was um, operative particular in the civil service. 
During the Kaiserreich, it was virtually impossible for a Jew to be appointed to a high judicial post, a university professorship, or a high-level administrative position, or last but not least, a higher rank in the military. And the argument was always the same, the Christian character of the state and its institutions, which was guaranteed by the Prussian constitution. To be sure, theoretically, the principle of equality would have violated Prussian state law, but in practical terms, the anti-Jewish discrimination was repeatedly justified likewise in legal terms, employing similar arguments which were easier than in the case of the also quite evident discrimination of Catholic in the state sector. And there are interesting works from the time who compare Catholic and Jews as far as the state discrimination in the state sector. Nonetheless, exceptions were possible now and then, and practices differed depending on the state. Moreover, disadvantage came to an end if a person underwent baptism. So it was primarily a religiously and not racially based discrimination. As difficult as it was in practice, the Jews in the German Empire could at least on principle contend successfully for their right to participate in the state and its structure, in sharp contrast to the Catholic Poles as we have seen. Moreover, in contrast with the Poles, the Jews were not subjected to any form of economic discrimination. Rather, to the contrary, because this is the time when the German Jews as a group completed their process of social development, of social advancement. Around the turn of the century, the greater majority of German Jewry were part of the German middle class. And for this reason, the Prussian Dreiklassenwahlrecht, three class franchise system, was also beneficial for the Jews, since it guaranteed them a representation that was influential, and in, especially in the towns and cities, and served to help shape the political climate um, there, as long as the liberal parties active there had the majority. As dedicated liberals, many Jewish politicians had, for example, been engaged, and vigorously so, in support of the anti-Catholic Kulturkampf, and also in the Germanization of the Prussian East. By contrast, over the longer term, it was the general and equal franchise of the Reichstag that had a double negative effect on the interest of the small Jewish middle class minority. Firstly, because liberalism down to 1914 suffered a dramatic loss in influence. And second, no check was put, put to the anti-Jewish polemics that emerged after 1880 due to the political calculations on part of the conservative parties who found that using some anti-Semitic propaganda would be helpful, or could be helpful. The only party with a mass base that consistently opposed anti-Semitism, namely social democracy, was for many Jewish citizens more a class enemy than a coalition partner. To that extent, the conclusion regarding the situation of the Jewish minority in the Kaiserreich must remain ambivalent as well. Discriminated as members of a non-Christian religion, they were nonetheless qua citizens and qua bourgeois um, middle-class citizens substantially integrated into the political system and certain areas of society, as I said, by, by class belonging um, and economic position. German anti-Semitism would not develop a new and ultimately deadly dimension until a further ingredient of stigma as a minority was added to the mix, suspicion of a clandestine loyalty external to the nation. What the Vatican was for the Roman Catholics and the Polish national movement for the Prussian Catholic Poles was for the Jews since the Protocols of Zion, the so-called world conspiracy, this figment of anti-Semitic fantasy that during and after the Great War imagined and constructed the Jew as capitalist war profiteers and or as Bolsheviks. And that after the German defeat appeared to a majority of Germans more and more plausible. Nonetheless, for my analysis of the mechanisms of inclusion and exclusion during the time of the empire, we should stick now to that time and polity, seeking to look at this historically in its own right, the empire. And for the sake of comparison, no, I have to do this here. No. Yeah. For the sake of comparison and review, I have tried to place the various group markers discussed here in a table. Um, and it's like a hierarchy. I, yeah, the Jews, I, mean, I, I, I was playing with hierarchies there with who would be have, you know, best off, but I think it's too difficult. So we just leave it at this um, because the marker class is not as clear as un, and unambiguous, at least when it comes to the two Catholic groups. 
So to conclude, I would argue that in the classic country of the wars of religion, religion in this phase was still the most important indicator of difference. Ultimately, religion beats language, as the cases of the Masurians and Memelander show. In combination with mother tongue, it constructed ethnicity and was thus decisive regarding the access to or exclusion from economic resources and political participation. Something which should ring a bell among all of us here, considering the huge democratic deficiencies caused by the German national naturalization laws up to today. A country that today celebrates as an act of humanity or even mercy, ein Gnadenakt, the granting of citizenship to someone who has worked and paid taxes in this country for more than 40 years, and then I quote, despite his or her deficient knowledge of the German language. I think this is obviously much more rooted in the late 19th century than we would like to think. And at the same time, it would seem utterly strange to the Prussian kings before 1871. And I think all this take now is obviously due to the deep link between the idea of the nation state, state and that of democracy, which at the same time explicitly or implicitly regarded homogeneity as a prerequisite for its functioning. Or to put it in the language of social cohesion, a certain amount of shared values which induces a certain positive attitude towards each other and the greater community as such. The question is, is this really so? Is this really necessary? As our colleague Tara Zara has shown for the Bohemian lands, this link was not necessarily God-given, but it was nationalist propaganda that turned a majority of indifferent citizens, which had been living, living reasonably civilized together, into, in her case, Germans and Czechs. In the case of the German Empire, it was a nationalist ideology plus a brutal statal effort of homogenization that resulted not foremost in cohesion, but in a deep religious divide on the one hand and to the almost complete disappearance of multilingualism on the other. In order not to be misunderstood, I do not want to exchange the good old days of the homogeneous German nation state for the better days of the multicultural empires. But I do think we should take both their lessons seriously and so far as to recognize the historical messiness of concepts like ethnicity in the first place. And ultimately, this forces us, as Till van Raden has recently argued, to take into account the ambivalent reality of a past that negates a binary log logic of difference or similarity, of autochthonous or foreign, of democracy and authoritarianism, conflict or cohesion. To overcome this binary logic, I think we still have some more theoretically and practical work to do, and I'm looking forward to this. Thank you very much. Yes, um, I, I could have done it in German as well. <laughs> uh, and uh, to put some pressure on you, we have now what the French call a petit quart d'heure uh, of, of this session because Stephanie uh, Schulen-Springorum has to leave at a little bit before the quarter to three. Uh, so please come up with questions, comments. You are in competition with the YouTube channel, so it might be that they are faster. Uh, we have. Really interesting. And, and um, I, I'm wondering. So, what was the kind of language that the that the German Reich used for their? You called them uh, national campaigns. Um, was kind of any term of cohesiveness? Uh, was it present during that time or? Was there any, or was it simply national unity? Um, yeah, so, so what was the framing uh, that they used for their campaign? The framing, oops, the framing was the unit, the national unity, which had been now recently achieved and which was, of course, very 
wasn't so clear. I mean, as you remember from school, the Kleindeutsche and the Russdeutsche, 25 million German speaking persons lived outside the borders of the German nation state, 40 inside, 25 outside. So it, it, it wasn't such a logical thing. And I think what I, what I would like just to, I would like us to unlearn the logic of that there had to be a nation state and this then developed into this and so on and so forth. I think we are still very much, um, yeah, now our, our thinking when we think about history is still very much framed in, in these, and of course this is nothing new because the historians are trying to fight against this, but it's still there. But it's something somehow illogic. And, uh, and, and when you look at, that's why I was so fascinated with the history of the Missourians, especially, that because it goes completely against all this, against this logic. But the language was not, as far as I remember the sources and my colleagues here from 19th century can correct me, is not cohesion but unity. Thanks a lot. Um, I just have a small question. You you listed Jews and German, um, the language, right? As far yeah. as I know, I mean, it was a very mobile time, right? Jew, I mean, Jews coming from Russia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Why why German? Just as a it's it was a, the man, the huge majority of the Jews living in Germany spoke German. Okay, and even those who came from from the east would easily adapt because of Yiddish being so close to German. Okay. So they were considered German speakers, even though the yeah, anti Semitic that was... propaganda wouldn't have it. But Exactly. I thought uh, it was always kind of a tension. No, but, but in Königs, now, the, now you make me talk about my PhD. I know. <laughs> in, Königsberg, I yeah, in Königsberg, there were Russian Jews, which were not, not all of them spoke Yiddish, but rather Russian. But um, then they would be bilingual, they would speak Russian and German. And this is what was, I think, the normality in, the, in, in, in Central Eastern Europe anyhow, that people would be multilingual, multi multi bilingual, multilingual, multilingual, would you? Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to compare uh, the German Empire to the Habsburgian Empire in that time, uh, because there, of course, we also have the story of persecution and discrimination and also the story of contestation of these uh, discriminatory po politics. So from the political uh, contestation view, there have been civil movements, but also intellectually, there have been theorists um, that try to find out how to accommodate minority issues and, and, and try to solve or regulate the national, nationalities question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of, of Otto Bauer and Karl Renner, for example, who really brought up some social innovations. And my question to you would be whether these ideas have spread uh, to East Prussia, whether activists have taken up uh, these ideas that try to solve, uh, especially, um, yeah, for example, an education for um, uh, locally dispersed migrant workers uh, and their children that they can be taught in their mother, lang uh, mother language. Thank you. As far as I know, and I must say this, as far as I know, no. Because it is a difference is as you no I wanted to I mean you remember the language map it's different from the Habsburg Empire because the Habsburg Empire had like under the Habsburg Empire we had areas of you know more or less one language and other languages next to each other but it was like Hung Hungary and then Croatian and so on and so forth it's a difference than here where it's really the margins and I think this makes a difference in the take on this thinking and. As, an, as a monarch, in a way. And the language that this is dealt with is, is really religious. As I, I, in my quotes, it's always about um, language has to do with being a good, um, not a citizen, a good untertan, a good sub, sub, subject. Yeah, sub, a good subject. And this w goes via religion, to be a believing subject and then to be a good subject. And the mother tongue is important there. And this is how they argue for Multi, uh, multilingual education because of this, not because it's it, it's not a, I mean, the contestation to this was never social. That's exactly the problem because it was the most, pop, most as I said, the poorest area, more or less. Yeah. And in, when, they got, when they went west, they, had to, they adapted and they lost Polish and they became Ernst Kutzora and others who spoke German. <laughs> 
So thank you, thank you so much for the um, presentation. Uh, this might be out of scope of what you have been working on, and for that I do apologize if that is the case. I was wondering whether we expanded the scope beyond Europe and the borderlands, immediate borderlands of uh, Germany, what categories and paradigms, principles of division would come to play if we considered um, German implication in Africa and other places beyond U Europe. So how do you, these uh, paradigms find their way to a space, to the imperial space, where language and uh, religion seem to be the master principles of division. I don't know whether I understood you. Like, um, I was wondering about, to be very blunt, uh, <laughs> about um, colonialism. Colonialism and the okay. paradigm of race and yeah. race as a um, principle of division in the longer historical perspective. Yeah, in, I mean, this would be a, in this context. a new lecture, but I think what is fascinating is the similarities because what is happening, in, especially in Masuria, which has a, was a colonial attitude because they were, they were, the, their luck was that they were Protestant. <laughs> I mean, because otherwise the, um, the attitude of somebody from Berlin towards this very backward, I mean, electricity came to, Mimeland in the 19 in the late 1920s so we are really talking about a huge difference from what we think is Berlin around 1900 is not the same as with what we have in East Prussia so I think what would be an interesting case study would be a comparison what Andreas Kossert has called a colonial a colonial take on the East and the difference is that via the Protestant Church and the national Protestant Church they are getting included via religion And maybe another point, which is important, sorry. Um, and of course, for the Catholic Poles, the brunt of extreme racism hits them already in the quote by Bismarck, but then in, in real life, in, of course, in 1939. I can add only one, one point. I guess what we see very uh, nicely, for example, is the norm. Reality. Yeah. yeah. So everyone was under the impact of the Jacobin idea that everyone has to have French in order to be a good Republican. Uh, 1793, with a reality of 80% not having French at all. Uh, and the same here. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, they had to manage in the 19th century a diversity of linguistic um, capacities. Uh, but the norm was a different one. Uh, what we see nowadays uh, is in many parts of the world the acceptance that monolinguism can't be the norm any longer. Uh, in particular in Africa, uh, but we see it in, in other parts as well where the old colonial language is no longer accepted as the norm, etc. And we are affected by that trend as well. More and more people come to this country expecting that multilinguism is the norm yeah. and not monolinguism. Uh, Nevertheless, we have these very strange um, offices checking if you have enough German to be a good citizen, except you play football at a certain level. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and, and it, 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 that's interesting how unity, where the norm was there but the reality was not yet there, uh, is the driving concept and now it is cohesion and cohesion presupposes that everyone has the language to contribute and to integrate into, into that. And I don't know how that will work. I don't think it can yeah? work. I don't, it, so. that's exactly, that was basically the point of, I, I found it fascinating how these discussions about language and education of the 19th century, how they resonate in, in, in our ears when we think about exactly these discussions on, on, on school language or bilingual schools and et cetera, et cetera. And, and the idea that you need a certain amount of German in order to become a citizen, it's still there. And I think we, we, it will not remain like this, but apparently it's a really long way to go. And now I have to go as well. Um, thank you. Uh, many, many thanks for uh, insight. <laughs>